probably going to be the hour that I'm going to have to do these things because it was looking like the last few weeks I was having a devil of a time finding an active connection with enough bars to be able to make things live because probably 7 p.m. Pacific time is in the middle of the universe of activity. So here I am at uh, one o'clock in the morning and it seems to be working a little bit better. So this will be the little episode. Here's our thank you for our patrons. Uh, uh, let us conclude our screen share and try to pick up on the episode I was doing before. Sorry, we won't have the option for uh, people to show up in uh, discussion unless somebody happens to spot me here in the wee hours of the morning. Um, all we have to do is to go a short while of time and I'll be able to put up all the postings and the information and change the title to make it match and all that. Anyway, continuing with our good old pal replacing Darwin. Uh, we're now into chapter nine, which is where he promises to explore how the species could originate. 7,000 in just the vertebrates and in 1,100 families in his view. Uh, and as the vastly larger, quote, invertebrate plant, fungal and bacterial species, unquote, in her footnote, he begs off uh, going into admitting with amazing understatement and without examples or sources. How, quote, why EC scientists are still debating the limits of ancestry in these species, and since some still lean toward placing it as low as the subgenus level, it's more difficult to make a numerically robust argument. Does he mean that? <laughs> the subgenus level is the species, isn't it? Pretty much. Uh, and uh, that there are some creationists thinking to make kinds at there for virtually everything other than humans uh, is news to me. So I'll be looking to see if anything gets clearer in the pages. Apparently, uh, there's nothing I can see in his subsequent work to suggest that he's pulling that little trick off, so I don't know. Um, the main text goes on basically with a reprise of his created heterozygosity argument uh, for Adam and Eve, which we know leads to preposterous conclusions, especially in his later book where he has things happening way too late in the uh, known record for things. Uh, we're going to be discussing that in volume two of the rocks were there, by the way. Um, Dan Stern Cardinale and others have dived into these aspects and we'll be alluding to all that. Anyway, um, that he does dump a few new sources in the notes regarding genetic combination. There's a 2015 paper from Williams uh, that uh, focused, um, it was a focus study on non-crossover gene con conversions, which details Jensen uh, repeated in his text. So basically he copied the content of it. And a 2016 one from Halderson, which explored uh, sex mutation differences. Perfectly fine. But uh, two of the papers contained information Jensen neither mentioned nor addressed in his own model. And I'll be putting the links up to those. There's a 2012 paper from Wang uh, from Cell, which is on human, uh, human sperm mutation rates, uh, with uh, one of its conclusions being something Jensen didn't allude to. Namely, quote, the combination of data from our study and the thousand genome project suggests that the germline mutation rate can vary greatly among different individuals, but not among different cells from the same individual. This may explain why the male mutation rate is not always higher than the female, unquote. Would that have any bearing upon the kind of dynamics that he's trying to do, given the fact that he's trying to do pedigree mutation rates as a surrogate for uh, fixation rates? Problems that Dan Stern Gardinale has pointed out about. And then the other paper is a 2015 one from Palomara, which uh, he had had an, uh, some content Jensen stepped around. It involves genetic data from populations over the last 100 generations, which is like 3,000 years or so, uh, to clarify mutation rates for longer rates. And their modeling was fully within the context of a long ago human split. And for further clarification, Palomara has a lecture on their paper that I'll be putting a link to, um, that their study deals with the last 400 generations of humans. In other words, 12,000 years, which is twice the age of the universe. And at the way outer boundary of the kind of argument that uh, Jensen was dangling at us earlier in the book. Um, it's going to be fun to see whether or not any of that starts bearing fruit in the rest of the uh, text here, because... Um, uh, <laughs> Jensen, Jensen and Tompkins uh, and Samford and all the rest are fascinating characters to watch in terms of their details. I, I uh, During the last couple of weeks when I haven't been able to get online, um, I've also been trying to dive into the 2019 paper that Jensen did. Uh, this is in connection to the new uh, Rocks Were There book uh, discussion. 
uh, where um, uh, Jensen tries to show that the data from a particular paper can be morphed in to match uh, a population growth if you view it within a young Earth creationist context. And although one of the charts in that 2019 paper uh, is just clearly just a formulaic transposition of the dates that originally were like 250,000 years going down uh, to um, uh, or within a few hundred years, the most recent haplotypes. Uh, he morphed all of that in to uh, show how improper and inaccurate the uh, evolutionary model was. But it leads to just preposterous conclusions where um, uh, all of the genetic data that the regular evolutionary model is putting in the period like three, four, five, six thousand years ago uh, is occurring in the 19th century, <laughs> in, according to this truncated version that he pops up with. Now, the later charts are are all treating this same data set as just surrogates for population growth. And I know that I've been having trouble figuring out how he gets his numbers. He's got a bunch of supplementary charts that's, that spread out all this stuff. And I, my preliminary looking in it looks like he's just making up numbers to go with uh, stuff. And Joel Duff can't figure out what the hell's going on with it. And uh, I don't think uh, Dan Stern Cardinale has had much success making sense of that stuff either. So we'll keep you posted as new developments come along. But it, it looks like there may be a shell game going on. Anyway, part two of the show uh, relates to uh, a 2022 post from Robert Carter, which is um, on carbon dating, which reprises the golden and oldies on carbon dating, including the statements that there are radiocarbon in dinosaurs and uh, diamonds, uh, as well as dissing the radiocarbon calibration. Oh, hello there, Slade. Hi, you're up. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I pardon. For, I've explained that that because of the difficulty of getting on for the last couple of weeks because of the the lack of bars. Um, I checked with the my internet provider and the like, and, and they indicated that I needed to be much more careful about how many little bars I have on my little Wi-Fi. And uh, so I thought maybe it's because there's just, oh, you're 4 p.m. Okay, see, it's a comfortable time for you. It may be the new hour for uh, the show because here it is a little after one in the morning and I've got four bloody bars, just fine and dandy. Uh, so uh, it's very possible I'm going to have to be moving the show here to the wee hours of the morning, and I'll do it Sunday evening. So new time, all the rest. Uh, anyway, um, uh, so I'll be putting material in following up on Jensen, and then this Carter piece on radiocarbon dating is just a, a hoot. He uh, brings up a new 2020 paper uh, in relation to syphilis, which uh, all connects up to the issue that Carter because of the weird chronology that Carter comes up with. He's trying to imply that syphilis appeared in Europe earlier than thought, but giving the thought to how the bacterium originated in their YEC model, like Sin, Flood, Babel, Bits, um, all the various pathogenic organisms are kind of touched on in a peripheral way by creationists and the volume two of the rocks were there is going to be going into that in some detail uh, including such fun and games as chlamydia and tuberculosis and a lot of these other things creationists are in a mess because we've got actual records of how these things have occurred in biology and how some of them end up in human beings and when that's taking place. And in some cases, you've got parasites and others that are known from Egyptian mummies and those whole bunch of things. So how do you go about dating all of this stuff? Um, creationists are facing a terrible mess, plus the theodicy problem of did God design the terrible organisms to do the terrible thing to begin with? That's not a model that's allowed in Carter's worldview. Everything is perfect. Perfect, wonderful, and benign. Nothing is ever doing anything bad. And it's only because Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden that nasty stuff has happened in a lickety split manner or not in a way that happens sometime after that or maybe at the time of the flood or maybe after Babel or somewhere in there. Please don't confuse me with any too much specifics. It's a mess. And as a historian, who knows a bit about Egyptian history and the history of China and the history of Samaria and the history of the civilizations in the Americas and the civilizations and cultures that built Stonehenge and uh, uh, megaliths in Malta and various other things. There is a pile of data 
that needs to be accounted for in the creationist model. So anyway, there's going to be this Majander paper that I'm going to be put in uh, on there that, but all of this is kind of a continual tease for the big work that's going to be popping up in uh, volume two of uh, the rocks here. Um, I've also been going through uh, the last 20 years worth of Institute for Patient Research acts and facts to make sure that a lot of their stuff is coordinated and some doozies of dumb stuff comes up when you go, oh, I didn't, ha I'd forgotten they'd never mentioned that, you know. Um, and I've been going through that context that the final section of that I'm doing on uh, the flood uh, mythologies and various stuff connecting to that and uh, uh, the, the um, soft tissue issue. I love saying that, the soft tissue issue. Um, and blood cells and so forth that are preserved in ancient organisms, at least according to the creationist dictates. Um, that's meant going through to find out how much of this stuff has actually been discussed at um, uh, in Acts and Facts and assorted literature. Uh, what I'll be having on that, for those of you who are familiar with volume one, and if you're not, why don't you have a copy of it? Tell everyone about it and get it for your libraries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, old RJ can use the royalties along with Jackson Wheat and I. And uh, but anyway, uh, that we tried to do charts. For example, we have a catalog in Volume One that lists off the various genera of feathered dinosaurs, ones that are known directly by the fossils, not inference. And likewise, we're going to be doing similar things here where it will be a full catalog of the various um, soft tissue things in chronological order with the technical papers. And then we'll be discussing the various creationist works that bump into them or not and how they misrepresent them or not, ending with the little bonbon of uh, Mark Armitage and his Triceratops horn, which, um, spoiler alert, there's significant doubt that it's a Triceratops horn, that it's most probably a bison, this particular species of extremely large bison, and uh, it, it's been very, very vague on that uh, front. But anyway, uh, there's going to be an awful lot of fun stuff in there. And um, uh, once it's all done, and after that, I'm just uh, knee deep also in sorting the material out for uh, the other main chapter that I'm doing. Uh, oh, yes, yes, it's, it is good to be heard clearly. Yes, as long as I got those little four stars. Uh, if this looks like the case that Spokane may be dead as a doornail at one o'clock in the morning, but the internet is just happy as a clam, then this is going to be the fixed hour. So um, um, we'll, I'll let everybody know on Twitter uh, afterwards that I'm switching the timing to uh, uh, Sunday um, night at uh, one in the morning, Monday morning, technically speaking, that that's going to be the new bit. But everyone, of course, can still watch it, you know, afterwards. And uh, I'm just delighted to see those nice, smooth little connections on there. Yipes. Um, anyway, I I've been also structuring to prep the work for the other main chapter that I'm doing, which is the cosmology chapter, where we'll be going into star formations, galaxy formations, creationist objections to the Big Bang, um, uh, Kent Hovind's ice canopy theory, uh, paleo, a, a polonium halos, and the Okla um, uh, atomic reactor that existed in Precambrian times. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to be in that material. Lunar dust, uh, the uh, formation of comets. There's a heck of a lot of stuff going on in that area. And I've been sorting all of my material out that I had accumulated. Um, our plan is that um, between the two books, there's a variety. I might as well give you a little teaser. Let me get this thing here. Anybody that's uh, zipped around in creationism land has spotted a variety of these sorts of things, like 21 reasons to think the earth is young. You may notice I have some annotations on that. Uh, we alluded to that in volume one. And... Um, Soft tissues are on there, human dinosaur coexistence, human population statistics, and so forth and so on. There's another one, 101 evidences for a young age of the Earth in the universe. Uh, this was uh, um, criticized uh, by <coughs> Rational Wiki that went through all of this stuff. So the idea is that I'm going to try to make sure that between the two of us, Jackson and I have pretty much hit all of these. So we will have a resource of information that um, all of these heavy duty issues uh, that creationists think are their heavy guns, there will be segments on it in between the two books. And uh, we said we hit about half of them in the first part and the second part we'll be dealing with the, the other half. Um, 
And something else that you won't find in the average creationist discussion, which is how their creationism has evolved over time and, uh, and how it changes its positions. Uh, Joel Duff has spotted how the, the new creationists have altered a lot of their views on natural selection and speciation. Uh, creationism has incorporated uh, plate tectonics uh, in a way that would have been anathema. Uh, back in the Dwayne Gish era, they, they've allowed for transitional forms. Uh, and Nathaniel Jensen seriously is saying, well, we've always accepted transitional forms. Really? Now? Yeah. We alluded to that, I think, in, in the uh, first novel. Uh, um, there's going to be a big appendix on something that finally uh, we were able to get a full, full range of the information, on, namely the Ark Encounters. This is what if you've ever seen a music or, or had the misfortune? Oops, where are the sessions? Um, so I'll probably uh, pull up here fairly shortly. Um, anybody who's been to the actual Ark Encounter or, or any of the various videos, I did one with the late Psy Strike. Uh, uh, I gave some narration on that. There is a big picture there of the kinds, roughly 1400 and some odd. But they don't list those kinds anywhere. You can't go to Answers in Genesis Ark Encounter and download that information. They're really cagey about it. So finally, um, uh, Erica, in fact, uh, Gutsik Gibbon was able to get a good resolution thing. And I had a resolution, a, a, a picture that was quite detailed, but there's some fuzzy parts on it. And between her list and mine, we'll be able to construct a comprehensive accounting of the Ark Encounter list. And then we can analyze the Ark Encounter list. First of all, it's not in alphabetical order. Why is it in the order that it is? Well, all they're doing, I think, is just riffing off of Wikipedia and the systematic listings in Wikipedia. But I'll be able to find that out in greater detail as we go through it in detail. Plus, what is listed as a kind or not? There's problems. In fact, I was just doing some stuff on this with um, uh, some Brian Thomas material from um, uh, devils, dinosaurs, and squirrel fossils uh, that uh, Brian Thomas did from uh, January of 2015 that snarks on a bunch of different fossils uh, that he's just saying, well, it looks like a beaver to me, so it must have been just a beaver, or it looks like a Tasmanian devil, so maybe it was just a Tasmanian devil. What is the Ark Encounter list? Because remember, all the main vertebrate groups are are on there. All terrestrial animals are functionally on the Ark. So it's going to be kind of funky to see, did the Ark Encounter decide that Repinomenus was just <laughs> a, a Tasmanian devil? Uh, are they listing it in the same group or are they treating it as a completely separate kind? And in which case, does this not imply that Brian Thomas and the Ark Encounter don't share notes, <laughs> which would be difficult to do anyway, because given the fact that they've not made it very clear as to how they have arrived at the number of kinds that there are. And Gutsik Gibbon has pointed out some eccentricities on some of the systematics with um, uh, primates and uh, there's stuff on various reptile groups and others that uh, Dapper Dino has mentioned in that. So there's an awful lot of material to wonder scratch your head, why do they have the items that they do? So there will be a listing not only of what they have, but I'll be restructuring it <coughs> so it'll also list them in alphabetical order so you can locate them uh, in a way that you can't from the picture at uh, Answers in Genesis and then go into um, whether or not there's some problems between it and other creationists. So it's going to be pretty fun. Um, between that, if, if you were impressed with volume one, I believe you'll be even more impressed with volume two because we, you know, we learn a little bit more. There'll be a slight modification in how I'm listing uh, sources. I'm underlining things to make them stand out a little bit easier uh, rather than the way that we use them in volume one. It will still will be even more thoroughly indexed. I'm, I'm constructing the index uh, right as we are going with all of the chapters to make sure that there's cross-referencing and things. For example, if you look under mountains, there will be a listing of all the various mountains as discussed in that. So it'll be even more comprehensive than the indexing in volume one. Um, and then there will be other books that we'll be dealing with in, in the future. So uh, for all everybody like Dapper Dino down there in Arizona, where everybody's broiling uh, here in Spokane, it's kind of 
cooler than usual. We've been in the 70s. It's been rainy and pleasant, which means I haven't been able to go out and mow my lawn. It's got jungle drums going on out there. It's so tall. Uh, but uh, it's very, very green. And I'm uh, we've got this jiggery pokery um, front that's pulling air down from uh, Canada. It's supposed to be warming up. So luck, I may be able to mow the lawn uh, this week. Uh, so anyway, um, we'll uh, thank you, Slade, for... Uh, um, being up and spotting that I am here and um, I'll uh, we're 20 minutes in I'll be uh, changing no I think Darwin uh, placing Tennyson anyway yeah let me see what the title is on this I think that was from the last episode uh, yeah I'll, I'll have to retitle it as well and put all the little referencing and stuff in so everyone will have all of that so um, this test has been successful uh, we'll see all oh lavender lady hello yes we'll um, uh, uh, you too, you, are, you must be up in just either very early getting up in the morning or whatever. How are you um, uh, flipping along in there? How's the health been holding up there? Um, I switched over to this time zone because uh, I, I, it looks like I might have a good chance of getting a better connection in hours when nobody else is on because, you know, seven o'clock was, I think everybody in the world was trying to do videos uh, at the same time and it was just sucking up. Uh, bandwidth the point where I could never get any good connections on this but this has just been running just beautifully at full full strength uh, all this time so um filling everybody in on, on the continuing project even though I have not been on the show every week I'm sorry patrons for my laxness on that front um rest assured I have been busy and um uh, this is um, um I've been full out on making sure that we've got as powerful an argument as possible and to keep it up to date so that by the time we get the production out, which will be later in this year or maybe early 2023, hard to sell, um, it will be very, very up-to-date technical literature and very, very up-to-date lambasting of creationists as well. So um, th there's such a wonderful range of material in there. And I, I have the advantage that Jackson doesn't in that I'm an old fart. And so I have a backlog of just decades worth of creationist literature that some of which is no longer available online at all uh, or was never online to begin with. It's uh, hard copy stuff. And so that gives a kind of historical perspective <coughs> that um, I'm hoping will be um, a really good, useful uh, adjunct to the literature to where everybody can go. And uh, my, the motto would be that if it ain't in our books, you can't be very important <laughs> because we will have covered all of it. So there you go. Um, muddling along in here as best I can. And uh, still also finishing up uh, as a note to dear old Brooke uh, to finish up the second Paralogs of Fog novel. I've been working on that for way too many years and that, but uh, it's it's been a, uh, that's the one up there. Uh, haven't let it go. Um, I, I have all the plot finished, and it's just a matter of completing out the last few chapters of it because I got all of those little bits and pieces in there, and it, it's uh, I get into a very different headspace when I'm writing the fiction than I do when I'm doing the nonfiction. So anyway, um, take care there, Lavender Lady Diane, and uh, um, if you're in a spot where you're hot, try to stay cool, and um, I'm muddled along here in a much more comfortable environment but other places are different and uh, we'll have some more exciting hearings um in the week on the january 6th stuff and find out what the hell's going on um i'm uh, still busily dumping on don jr on twitter uh when he says stupid stuff um and which he does quite a bit and every once in a while you get some material that's actually relevant to some of the stuff that's going to be product in some of the later books because we're, Jackson and I are going to be doing a work on um, conspiracy theories, which will include uh, climate denialism and political extremism. There's a whole bunch of topics on that and eventually a thing on the evolution and origin of religion and that that's going to be another book. So we'll be very, very busy and uh, um, that keeps me uh, uh, always occupied even when I don't have enough stars bars to be able to do the video but we'll see give it a give it cross fingers we'll see you again next sunday monday morning same time same channel everybody stay safe and we are now cutting off our uh, stream